to the reader. It was the saying of a servant of Christ, Every day a Christian spends on earth is a day lost in heaven. He meant it of the place, not the company. For what makes heaven but union and communion with God in Jesus Christ? This being attainable in this life, what keeps a Christian from living in heaven while he lives upon earth? Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, verse 3. Our conversation is in heaven, said another apostle. Philippians 3, verse 20. And I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2, verse 20. These were men on the earth subject to infirmities as we are, yet living in heaven. And there are yet in this declining, wanton, Christ-denying age, a generation upon earth thus living, whose lives and graces, though hidden under a mean outside, under many reproaches and infirmities, yet shine inwardly with the glory of Christ upon them, who, though they are in the world, yet follow the Lord with a different spirit than the spirit of the world. And among these hidden ones of the Lord, this blessed man, the preacher of these sermons of whom the world was not worthy, was such a one who, while he was upon earth, lived in heaven. And as you may easily perceive, the end and scope of these sermons is to wind up your heart to a like frame and posture, meaning to take it off of a of perishing vanities and to set it on that which is the real and durable substance. We see upon what weak shoulders the fair neck of all worldly pomp and glory now stands, and how the Lord is winding up and putting an end to the glories of the kingdoms of men who have not yet contributed their strength and power to the advancing, but rather to the pulling down and eclipsing of the glory of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Besides what the world tells us, never has an age had more examples laid before them of the world's vanity than in our days. Therefore, our hearts should sit loose to all things that cannot stretch themselves to eternity. The Apostle's reason is full of weight. It remains that they that have wives be as though they had none and they that weep, as though they wept not, and they that rejoiced, as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy, as though they possessed not, and they that use the world, as not abusing it. And this exhortation he puts on by this argument, the time is short, or, as the word is, the remainder of our season is now folding up as a veil or curtain into a narrow room. Time is short, and life shorter, and the end of all things is at hand. We have greater things to mind and to set our hearts upon. The divinity of this holy man's spirit did much appear in this, that having much of the comfort that earth could afford him, he still looked upon all creature contentments with the eyes of a stranger, and in order to the raising of his soul to a more holy, humble, serviceable, self-denying walking with God. For a man who enjoys little or nothing in this world, to speak much of the world's vanity and emptiness, and of taking the heart off that, is not as much as when a man is surrounded with the confluence of creature comforts then, by a divine spirit, to tread upon the neck of these things, and to be caught up into the third heaven, bathing, solacing, and satisfying itself with sweet and higher enjoyments, with the more savory and cordial apprehensions it has of Jesus Christ. This is comparable to the one who is made a partaker of the divine nature, and who lives above the world in the enjoyment of the world. So now, reader, you have these sermons twice printed, once in the practice of this holy man, and once again in these papers which we present to you in this preaching style, though we confess things might have been more contracted. Because we find this more desired, 
more acceptable to his hearers, and, if we mistake not, more working upon the affections and more profitable to the greatest number of Christians. The Lord Jesus be with your spirit and go along with these and all his other precious labors to the furtherance of the joy of your faith, building you up in the inner man and directing you in the way to your eternal rest. Thomas Goodwin, William Bridge, William Greenhill, William Adderley, John Yates, Sidrach Simpson, and Philip Nye. Chapter 1. The text opened. Philippians 3.19. Who mind earthly things? This precious scripture clearly holds forth the different dispositions of wicked and of godly men, especially of such wicked men as set themselves against the gospel. For it relates to such as were professed enemies to the cross of Christ, that labored as best they could to hinder the success of the ministry of Paul. You will find, if you look back a few verses, that this is meant of that kind of men especially, for he tells us that many walked so, as they were enemies to the cross of Christ. There were those that opposed the preaching of Paul and his ministry. He describes those men by diverse characters, but I'll treat none of them but this, who mind earthly things, who savor or relish earthly things. You may translate this as well. It is a general word, comprehending the actions and operations of both the understanding and the will. It is, in Scripture, applied to both, but most commonly to the actions of the will and affections. We will deal particularly with actions of the will. Earthly things are those that are on the earth, whatever they are, the beauty, the glory, and pageantry of the earth, the prophets that are earthly, the pleasures and honors of the world, who mind any things inordinately that are sublunary accommodations. But we carry and behave ourselves as free citizens of the city of heaven, for so the words in the original are, if we should thus read them, our city, where we are citizens and where we have rights, is heaven. But our conversation, our city converse, is of things that are above the earth. When the apostle would have men to follow his example and not the example of others, in the 17th verse, he uses this as an argument that such and such men are enemies to the cross of Christ, and they make their belly their God, and they mind earthly things. Do not follow them. Do not hearken what they say to you. They come up and down from house to house and whisper this and that to you, and would take you off from the ways of God. God has begun to enlighten you and to stir your consciences. Do not let the precious affections of your souls run toward them, but be followers of us as we are of Christ, for our conversation is in heaven with our Lord and Master, this argument coming in the 20th verse. That being the only scope and meaning of the words, take this doctrinal truth. This is the great difference between a wicked man and a godly man. One minds earthly things, and the other has his conversation in heaven. I intend to handle both these in order. One of these minds earthly things. It is a parallel scripture to Romans 8 verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Do mind. There is the same word, only here it is the participle and there it is the verb. But the meaning is the same. They that are after the earth mind earthly things. They that are after the flesh favor fleshly things. The first part of this point is the description of wicked men. They that are enemies to the cross of Christ and to the ways of godliness. They are men that mind earthly things. And the more gross of them are described before this as having their bellies as their gods. Some of them are very sensual drunken, 
unclean, and altogether given to satisfy the flesh and fleshly lusts. But there are others that do not appear to be so brutish, yet they are men of earthly minds who savor only earthly things. And these are the men that are secret enemies to the cross of Christ, yea, and will many times appear so to be. It will break out at length. Such a man whose spirit has been earthly for a long time will appear at length to be an enemy to Christ's cross. Now, in the handling of this point, I will propound these five things. First, what it is to mind earthly things in a sinful way, or thus. When a man may be said to be an earthly-minded man, that we may know when a man is an earthly-minded man, what it is to mind earthly things that the apostle describes here a wicked man by. Without the opening of this, all that I shall say afterwards will be to little purpose. Secondly, the great evil that there is in minding earthly things, and I shall help you discover a greater evil in it than you were aware of. Thirdly, lay down some proofs whereby those men and women that think they are clear of this sin may have it revealed to their consciences that they are the men and women that do mind earthly things. Fourthly, I shall search into the reason why the hearts of men and women are so much after earthly things. Fifthly, I shall labor to take your hearts off of earthly things. These are the five things that are to be done in the first part of the point, namely, the character of wicked men here laid down who mind earthly things. First, who they are that mind earthly things. Certainly, they are not all those that enjoy earthly things. All men who make use of earthly things must not be condemned for minding them. Paul himself, in this very epistle, Philippians 4, verse 12, wrote that though he knew how to want, yet he knew how to abound. He could tell how to make use of earthly things, and he gives charge that all those that are instructed should make such as had instructed them partakers of all their goods. Paul charges this. Yea, Christ himself, in that scripture where he labors most to take the thoughts of men off the earth, and not to take any thought for what they should eat or drink, still says... Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. Matthew 6, verse 32, and Galatians 6, verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth all good things. And if there be any pretense against it, yet he says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Therefore, it is not here charged as a mark of an evil man to have earthly things and to justly require what is due unto him, as Paul does here. And the Galatians could not charge him with breaking his own rule, which he wrote to the Philippians. Therefore, we must inquire what is meant by minding earthly things. When, a man, or when does a man or woman mind earthly things in a sinful way? For that, there are several particulars. Chapter 2, Earthly Mindedness, Discovered in Nine Particulars. The first is this. When a man looks upon earthly things as the greatest things of all, when he has a high esteem of earthly things as the things, as if it were thus, Oh, if I had such and such things as others have, oh, how happy would I be! How happy are such and such that do enjoy such earthly things at their will, in their dwellings, their furniture, their comings in. Oh, these are the excellent things. These are the delightful things. These are the things in which felicity and happiness consist. When men promise themselves felicity in any earthly things, they mind earthly things. 
I remember Golden Mouth Chrysostom had a speech about a covetous man who looked upon his money and saw more beauty in his money than in the very sun that shines in the firmament. Men look upon the things of the earth as the most beautiful things in their eyes. Certainly a man is in a distemper when he puts such a high esteem upon any earthly things. This esteem is not according to what God and his saints put upon earthly things. God never puts any great eminency on any earthly thing. He never made any earthly things to be any great conduit or means of conveyance of any great good from himself unto his creature. If you would know where your heart is, you may know it by this one sign as much as any. What do you count your excellency? According to what any man or woman counts their excellency to consist in, so is their heart. Their hearts are suitable. In Genesis 27, verses 28 through 39, you find Isaac blessing Jacob and Esau. But I would have you observe the difference in the placement of them. Observe the blessing of Jacob in verse 28. There God gives the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine as Jacob's blessing. Now look at Esau's blessing, for the blessing was suitable to their disposition. Jacob's father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above. Mark it. Isaac blesses them both with the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth. But in Jacob's blessing, the dew of heaven is first, and the fatness of the earth is second, while in Esau's blessing, the fatness of the earth is first, and then the dew of heaven. Note this, that a godly man stands in need of earthly things. As Christ said, your father knows you stand in need of these things. But the great thing in the first place that a godly heart minds is the dew of heaven, and then secondly, the blessing of the earth. Now a carnal heart thinks that it has some need of the things of heaven. It will acknowledge that. But it's the fatness of the earth they desire, and then the dew of heaven. So that's the first thing. Earthly-minded men look upon these things as the high and chief things, and hence it is that the choice thoughts of an earthly-minded man are carried out on worldly objects. Secondly, when the creamy choice thoughts of men and women are busied about earthly things, they mind earthly things in a sinful manner. You may know what kind of hearts you have by your thoughts about anything. The thoughts are the immediate ebullitions or rising up of the heart, that is, the bubbles that come from the heart immediately. A man cannot know what is in his heart as much by words and actions as by the thoughts, because the thoughts immediately spring from the heart. For example, I can tell what the water is in such a fountain better from that which bubbles up immediately from the fountainhead than I can tell by the water that runs in the stream a mile or two off that never came from the fountainhead. That which immediately bubbles from the fountainhead reveals the nature of the fountain. The thoughts are, as it were, the firstborn of the heart, and therefore the heart may be known by the thoughts. The Holy Ghost said in Proverbs 23, verse 7, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That which is here spoken in particular may be applied in general. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As his thoughts are, so is he. The heart is as the thoughts of the mind are. Men may keep words in and actions out by respects. If you could know where, or what the heart is and look into the haunts of it in secret, that would reveal to you what you are. Many of your servants, when in your presence or before others, may out of respect carry themselves fairly. But if you would find them out, labor to know what they do when they are alone in their private haunts. So, would you know your own hearts? 
Do not look so much at them and take a scantling of them by how you behave yourselves in words and actions before others, but what they are in your private chambers, what they are in the inward thoughts of the mind. There the heart comes to be discovered most. By these thoughts, I do not mean every kind of injection or suggestion, for sometimes the devil may cast evil thoughts into the most holy. But I mean such thoughts as are sweet to the soul, whereby the soul comes to suck out sweetness and contentment, for that's minding earthly things. When you find the strength of your thoughts to be upon the things of the earth, and they are more suitable to your hearts than any other. It is not when through weakness the mind may be wandering this way or that way, or through suggestions or temptations, but men or women are most themselves when alone and free. Can you say when you're alone, Oh, the very thoughts of God are sweet to me. I meditate in his law day and night. Can you suck out sweetness there as from a honeycomb? But an unclean wretch will suck sweetness out of his unclean thoughts when he is alone. The earthly-minded man will suck sweetness out of his earthly thoughts, and the ambitious man the sweetness of his pride when he is alone, and these are the most contentful thoughts to him. He can run two or three hours and take delight and pleasure in them. That's earthly-mindedness. The third thing is this. An earthly-minded man is one whose heart cleaves to the earth. As I told you, the word was not only to mind, but to savor the things of the earth. His heart cleaves to the earth. The psalmist, in a far different case, said that his soul cleaved to the dust. But that's true of many men in this case. Their very souls cleave to the dust. Their spirits are mixed with the earth, and therefore they are dross. It may be that they have some good common gifts, some good natural parts, and some workings of the Holy Ghost upon them, yet their spirits are drossy because they are mixed with the earth. Talk to these men of the vanity of the things of the earth. They will give you a hearing, but when you have done all, their souls cleave to the earth. And talk to them of the excellency of heavenly things. They will hear you, but when you have done all, their souls still cleave to the earth, as a man whose soul cleaves in love to a woman, as it is said of Samson, his soul did cleave to Delilah. Say what you will against that woman, or of the excellency of any other woman, yet his soul cleaves to that woman. So it is in an earthly-minded man. Let what will be said against the things of the earth or what can be said for the setting forth of the excellency of the things of heaven, yet his soul cleaves to the earth, as the serpent's belly did to the dust of the ground. That is an earthly-minded man. Fourthly, an earthly-minded man is one whose heart is filled with distracting cares about the earth, what he shall eat and drink, and what he shall put on, how he shall provide for himself and his family, and what shall become of him. Though he is well now, what may become of him afterwards? When the heart is filled with distracting cares about the things of the earth, as far as the heart has these prevailing over it, so far such a man may be judged to be earthly. There are but two things that cause distracting cares about any business. The first is an apprehension of some very great evil. In case I should be disappointed, I look upon my disappointment as a most intolerable evil to me. If I should be disappointed, I do not know what in the world to do. That's the first. The second is an uncertainty in the means for the prevention of this disappointment. When I look upon disappointment as a great evil, I cannot trust those things that present or prevent and help me against disappointment to do so. I see them as being too weak to help me. Notwithstanding such means, I may yet be disappointed. This causes distracting thoughts. So, in the things of the earth, an earthly-minded man or woman has his thoughts filled with distracting cares about the world. First, looking upon the things of the world as such great things. They think that if they are disappointed, it will be undone. 
They look upon it as such a fearful, insufferable evil to be deprived of their estate and outward comforts in this world. Secondly, they don't look upon the means of provision for themselves and their families as having any certainty in it, which is a main thing to be considered. As for outward things in the world, they find by experience there is uncertainty in them. And then for any promise that there is in Scripture that God will provide for them and their families, alas, that they dare not trust. That's a thing that of all means they think to be the weakest. Lord have mercy upon us, they say. If they have nothing else to trust but a word of Scripture, they think of themselves as most miserable and wretched. But now, it would be otherwise with the soul if it were not earthly-minded. It would not be in any great pause how things fall out here in the matters of the world. It's true. Perhaps I may miscarry in such a business, and my estate may be taken from me by the Chaldeans or the Sabians, as was Job's. But I shall not be undone, and my happiness is not gone. I shall have that which will comfort me when all that is gone. Suppose the worst. Yes, this will not undo me. Indeed, a man that sends his whole estate abroad in a venture is very solicitous, because if there is bad news about it, he is undone. But another man who has a great deal of riches, a house, lands, and a stock at home to maintain him and his family, if bad news comes, he thinks, I have a stock at home to live on. He is not as solicitous. So a worldly man has all his stock in the earth. There's his only portion. And if he miscarries there, he is undone. But a godly man, though he has the things of the earth, yet he has something else. Treasures in heaven to rest upon besides the earth. And therefore he is not as solicitous. And then for the second... The uncertainty of means and help. If a godly man looks upon outward causes, he sees all as uncertain, but he has a promise to rest upon. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Cast your care upon me, for I care for you. This he looks on as a certain means and help. Whatever falls out, here's a promise that he can build upon and therefore this takes off his solicitous cares. But an earthly-minded man's heart is filled with distracting cares, because he looks upon himself as undone if he miscarries here, and has nothing more than the creature does for his provision in this world. Fifthly, an earthly-minded man or woman is one whose great business of his heart and endeavors of his life are about the things of the earth. He makes it his great business, and the strong endeavors of his spirit are exercised in the things of the earth. He eagerly and greedily works with the strongest intention about these things, how the whole soul, the whole man is laid out about the world. It is the adequate object of his soul. You will say, other men are busy in their callings as well as these that you count earthly-minded men. Yes, but they are busy in their callings and obedience to God. And for outward things, they set aside their obedience to God. Then all the things that they busy themselves with in the world, were it not under that consideration that they were obeying God in it, they would not be adequate objects for their souls. By an adequate object, I mean that which is sufficient to take up the whole strength of the soul to lay it out fully. I'll give you this example to show you what I mean by an adequate object. You have a little child playing sports. This sport has as much in it as there is in his spirit. There is a kind of equality between his spirit and such a sport. A child receives enough benefit from a sport that it's worth laying out all his strength and might upon it. Now it may be sometimes a man or a woman will play with their child. They will play as the child does, but this sport is not an adequate object. A man or woman will play with the child for a while, 
but there is not enough good in this play to fill their souls, though it is fully adequate to the desires of the child. These things are not fully adequate to the desires of a man or woman. They have other matters in their heads than these, and businesses of a higher nature. And so it is in those that are not earthly-minded. Though they may be busied about the things of this world, yet they use the world as if they used it not. The things of the world are not adequate objects to their hearts. A spiritual heart reserves the chief strength of it for higher things. I follow these things in the world, but I reserve the chief strength for a more desirable good. If a man has friends come to him, perhaps some of an ordinary rank come first. He makes ordinary provision for them, but if he has any choice things for entertaining, he reserves them for some choice friends that are coming. So a man that is not of the world, though he may be busy in earthly things, yet the choice of his heart he reserves for things of a higher nature. I remember Tertullian had a speech of the Christians, how they ate and drank when they supped. They ate and drank so as they remembered they were to pray that night before they slept. So a gracious spiritual heart follows his outward business in the world, but remembers he is to converse with God that night before he sleeps, so that he reserves the strength of his spirit for communion with God. But the other lays out all his strength as if he had nothing to do afterwards. In this, an earthly and a spiritual heart are quite contrary. The apostle would have godly men to use the world as if they used it not. Contrarily, an earthly-minded man uses spiritual things as if he used them not. How an earthly-minded man's heart is in spiritual things, so a spiritual mind is is in earthly things. An earthly-minded man will do some things that are spiritual. He will come and hear the word. Perhaps he will pray in, in his family and read a chapter, but his heart is not there. He does it as if he did it not. Come and hears as if he heard not, and prays as if he prayed not. He does not make it his business to pray or hear a spiritually minded man does worldly things as if he did them not, in comparison to being busy in spiritual things. Those he does with all his might. An earthly minded man is like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We read that they were swallowed up by the earth. So the truth is, the things of the earth contentments, provision for themselves and families and earthly things, opens and swallows up the very hearts of earthly-minded men. Sixthly, suppose a man does not seem to be so strongly inclined to lay out his whole strength and heart about earthly things. Yet when any man or woman shall seek any earthly thing for itself and not in subordination to some higher good, this is an earthly-minded man. For as this prevails in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, our Apostle Paul speaks of the things that are seen that are but temporal. While we look not at the things that are seen, for the things that are seen are earthly and temporal, or temporal. The word is as much as if to say, while we look upon temporal and earthly things that are seen, we do not make them our end. We seek them in subordination. There is something else that we look at as higher in all these things. For instance, a man who is godly follows his business as other men do, but what is it that I, he, would have? It is this, I show my obedience to God, and I would provide those things that may be helpful to me to serve God in my generation. That is my end. I can appeal to God in this, that even in following my business and all outward things, it is so that I might follow God in the use of means for the providing of such things as may enable me to serve him the more in my generation. This is my scope in what I do. 
But now on the other side, an earthly-minded man makes his scope to follow his business and look about the business of his calling that he might gain. He would get that he might get. He would have more that he might have more. And that he and his children might be somebody in the world. It may be that he might have enough to have his will and lusts, and therefore he follows his business very intently, merely that he may get to satisfy the flesh. Yes, indeed, all the good things that he does, he brings them in subordination to earthly things. You may take it thusly. A spiritual man does not seek earthly things for himself, but an earthly man does. Or more fully, an earthly man is earthly in all that he does do, both in earthly and spiritual things, and a spiritually minded man is spiritual in all he does, both in spiritual and in earthly things. When an earthly man is in earthly things, he is altogether earthly. He does not look at obedience to God in what he does. A spiritual man says, I'll follow my calling because God has required it. But an earthly man thinks, I'll follow it because I see gain coming from it. This is earthly. Though the things are lawful, and it is your duty to follow your calling, but to follow it merely for gain, this is earthly. But because it is your duty, and it is the place God has set you in, that is spirituality and earthly things. An earthly man is earthly in earthly things, and he is more earthly in spiritual things. When he performs spiritual duties, he has an earthly end in it either to get esteem from men or to cover some evil. Perhaps merely for form or fashion he does it in an earthly way, and it may be at most that he does it merely for his own quiet, to satisfy his own conscience. Now a spiritual man is spiritual in earthly things. One of a spiritual mind is more heavenly and spiritual when he is about his calling, though it be the lowest, like cutting hedges or digging ditches, pulling ropes or lines, or using his axe or hammer. He is more spiritual at these than is an earthly man when he is praying or hearing or receiving sacraments. Certainly it is so, and it will be found to be so at the great day of judgment, when all the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed. That which we may add as a seventh, is that he is earthly in spiritual things. I grant that the best of the saints may have some earthliness in spiritual things, but I speak of the predominance. It's that which rules in the heart, so that in the performance of spiritual things, his very ends are but earthly, and the frame of his heart is but earthly in spiritual performances. The eighth thing wherein we may find an earthly-minded man is this, that he passes through many and great difficulties in matters of the earth, and they are very little to him. Though he toils a great deal in matters of the earth, he is never weary because he is in his proper element. Therefore, let there be what difficulties there will be, which to another man would be very great. He makes them as nothing. And though there is much toil and labor, yet he is not weary. Why? Because he is in his own element. The fish is not weary with swimming, but a man is quickly weary. It is because the fish is in his element, and the man is not. Observe this. When a man's spirit is in this kind of temper, let him be busied about earthly things, wherein earthly advantage comes in, no difficulties will hinder him, no wind or weather. He will rise in cold mornings and go abroad, and do anything in the world. Oh, what difficulties will men endure in storms at sea, and hazards there, and troubles at land, and sit up late, and rise early, and toil themselves, and complain of no weariness or difficulties? But let them come to spiritual things, to soul business that concerns God and their spiritual estates. Every little difficulty puts them aside and discourages them. Every molehill is a mountain in their way. I would do so and so, but it is so hard and 
tis tedious to rise in a morning, and especially in cold winters, and it is very hard and difficult to read and pray, and so he complains of the difficulty of these things. To watch over the heart is a very difficult thing. To an earthly man, any spiritual thing is difficult, and the difficulties discourage him. In spiritual things, oh, how weary are they! In Malachi 1, verse 13, they cry out, What a weariness is it! But they can follow the business of the world from morning to night and never get tired. They can work like a horse and never be out of breath. I wish you would try once to spend one Sabbath exactly and see what a weariness that would be to you. Resolve just one Sabbath to rise early in the morning and to have your thoughts spiritual and heavenly as much as you can. Then get up and pray alone in your closet. Then read and hear and meditate and mark what you hear. And when you go home, think of it and confer about it. And when you come again to attend on the word, and so spend the whole day in hearing, reading, and meditating, and conferencing about good things, calling your family to account, and praying again. See how tiresome this will be to your hearts if they are carnal. However, a spiritual heart will call the Sabbath a delight. And the Sabbath unto such an one is no other than a type and forerunner of that eternal day of rest it shall enjoy in the kingdom of heaven. One that is spiritual counts the Sabbath to be a day of rest, but an earthly man is quickly tired in spiritual things. He will give up his work and not go through it. We read in Nehemiah 4 verse 6 that Nehemiah spoke of the great difficulties that they met with in their work, and yet the work went on, for they had a mind to it. So look how a man's mind is. He will be able to go through with his work. If a man is an earthly-minded man, he will go through with his work. If he takes up worldly business, he will go through with it, for he has a mind to it. He is an earthly-minded man. But let him take on a spiritual work, and he will lay it aside before it is half done. He will seldom bring to perfection any spiritual work. Why? because he has no mind to it. Whereas if the heart were spiritual, and there were any spiritual work undertaken, such a one would go through with it until all was finished. Another note, the ninth particular, which describes an earthly-minded man, is this. An earthly-minded man is one that conceives the most heavenly truths that are revealed in the Word, and in, er and in an earthly way, according to his mind, his genius, and the disposition of his own heart. I truly think this is meant in a special manner in this place, for the apostle is speaking of those that opposed him in his ministry, and that were enemies to the cross of Christ. Now these, mind earthly things, their minds are of an earthly temper, and therefore it is no wonder they do not savor those heavenly and spiritual truths that we bring to them. For their minds, being earthly, do only apprehend those things after an earthly manner. Now, what was the great truth that the Apostle brought to the Philippians? It was the way of reconciling the world to God, of making our peace with God, and of our justification through Jesus Christ. Now, there is no point of religion more spiritual, heavenly, and divine than the doctrine of reconciliation and of justification by Jesus Christ. So that one who is of an earthly disposition, though he may be convinced of a necessity of pardon of sin and peace with God, yet apprehends the making of his peace with God and obtaining pardon of sin in an earthly manner. He has carnal thoughts and apprehensions about his place with God and obtaining pardon of sin. He thinks it is the same way that one man obtains peace with another when there has been a falling out and of getting pardon from another man that he has offended. He conceives it in an earthly way. He looks upon his making peace with God by something that he must perform. But the free justification by the grace of God in Christ, it's too divine, spiritual, and heavenly for an earthly-minded man to apprehend. An earthly-minded man's apprehensions of God 
are only in a carnal, earthly way. As the prophet speaks in Isaiah 1 verse 3, the ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib. In the same way, an earthly-minded man knows God like an ox knows his owner and the ass his master. The ox knows his owner since he brings him fodder daily. So an earthly-minded man has no other apprehensions of God but that God gives him good things in this world. God makes his corn to grow or prospers his voyage. An earthly-minded man may rise so high as to have apprehensions of God as bringing good things unto him here on earth, but one that is spiritual and heavenly apprehends God as God. He does not look upon God merely as good in respect of the benefit he receives from God here, but he looks upon God as he is in himself. He sees the face of God. There's a great deal of difference between a man that knows another man and a beast that knows a man. The ox knows his owner. The ox knows the man that brings hay or provisions to him. But a man knows a man in another way. He knows what the nature of a man is, what it is to be a rational creature. So one who is spiritual knows what God is in himself. He sees the face of God and understands what God is in another way than others do. The difference between the, know, uh, between the knowledge of God that a spiritual soul has, one who is pure in heart, and the knowledge of God that an earthly heart has is just as different. As the ox knows the man that drives him to fat pastures, so an earthly man knows God gives him good things. But a spiritual man knows God as one man knows another, not in the full excellency, but there is such a difference in some degree between the apprehensions of God in a spiritual heart and the apprehensions of God in an earthly heart. We might mention many other spiritual and divine truths that an earthly-minded man apprehends only in an earthly way. For example, consider heaven itself. How does an earthly-minded man apprehend that? He apprehends that he shall be delivered from pain and shall have some kind of glory, but he knows not what it is. He conceives it according to the way of the earth, some pompous, glorious thing that he shall live in pleasures and not in pain, and so apprehends all the glory of heaven, but in sensuality. A spiritual heart looks at heaven in another way. He looks upon the enjoyment of communion with God and Jesus Christ in heaven, and living the life of God in heaven. That is a thing an earthly heart has no skill in at all, neither does a heart so much as savor it. Thus, I have in these several particulars revealed what an earthly-minded man is. Oh, that you would lay your hands upon your hearts and consider how far these things reach you. But besides these, I have diverse other arguments to convince the consciences of men and women that there is still much earthliness in them, but we shall treat them in order later. The second head to consider is this. The great evil of earthly-mindedness is that they mind earthly things. Is that such a great matter, you say? We cannot imagine the transcendency of the evil there is in this. We think there's a great deal of evil in swearing, whoring, drinking, and such scandalous sins. But to have an earthly mind? We do not think this to be such an exceeding evil. Yet you will find that the scripture speaks most dreadful things against this. And if God is pleased to set them upon your hearts, I hope that much glory may come to God by it, and much good to you in particular.